Hey there, everybody. Welcome in today. Welcome in today. I'm finishing up with some last second adjustments here just before I switch over. But first off, I want to say thanks to Leaf and, of course, Don Honk for showing up in the chat early today. If you guys can uh, hear me out there fine, just let me know with something in the chat. And we'll get things ready to get started over here on today's show. Great, 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 great. Well, hello, and welcome back, everybody. I have uh, been working extra hard the last, oh, the last couple days to get things ready. And uh, so before I get started today, thank you all for joining me. And thank you for confirming, everybody, that the sound is good. And thank you uh, for being patient. I thought I was going to be able to have this big plan of streams over the last week. And my goodness, it's been quite a crazy adventure over the last 10 days. So I wanted to uh, kind of fill you all in on what's been happening. We'll get some, get some more people pouring into the chat here. And of course, I do have an exciting uh, run-through on my latest restoration, which was a Sony FW900. But before we get started, uh, just do me a favor. If you're able to, click the like button for us today so that we can get out there and the reach will be there and everybody on YouTube will know where to go at this moment for some high quality CRT content. And um, anyway, uh, second big announcement. Second big announcement before we get into story time and what's been happening here lately. Um, there's a new video tomorrow, and I already put a premiere up for it. It's actually the pinned comment in the chat right now, in the live chat. There's a pinned comment. It's just going to the premiere of that. That will be ready tomorrow. It's already set to go. And so that's another big announcement. That'll be ready tomorrow. It's going to be a fun video. I think you're going to enjoy it. I actually had compiled four different um, unboxings of all PVMs that I bought off eBay recently. And boy, what a nightmare that was. So, wow. Uh, four of those. I did have some troubleshooting where one of them had a lot of problems. So there's a lot of good stuff in that video. And that'll be up tomorrow. And uh, so before we do that, yeah, I'm going to say some shout outs to some people. Looks like Guillerme Solda is here. Hello to Natenter Space. Natenter Space. Demon 20 Child. Roll Pats. And uh, everybody else here. Persian Immortal. Relaxing Music. The Bob Ross of Retro Gaming Repairs. I don't think I've taken over Voltar's title. Uh, so don't worry about that. But I'll be here to uh, get as close as I can to the uh, cusps of Voltar's abilities. Because he's still, you know, he's still one of the best soldering experts there is um, in this community. Speaker Adventures, thanks for showing up. Thanks for showing up, PO17. And uh, Fujiko, Jeff Hampton. Thanks again, everybody. So, yeah. Feel free to chat about things that they've been going, how things have been going for you guys. Uh, hey, super guy. Good to see you here, too. And um, I'm going to go through, and I'm just going to go through. I've got a list of things that I actually wanted to just mention here before I actually get started on the restoration stuff. 
And first off is just a little story about basically what happened after the last stream, which I'm trying to think about on my schedule. It was over a week ago, you know, um, and it was the unboxing after actually of Super Guy CRT had sent in a couple of cool little CRTs. And I got to unbox those on the channel. And then I was like, well, look, we'll try to get some streams going. So right after that, right after that, I had uh, gotten into working on, after that all came in, I got into working on the Sony FW900. A beautiful monitor. And that's what we're going to go through here in a second. So I got into those repairs. It was about a day or two. And um, after I had gone through and recapped, I think every board, it was Friday evening. I'll never forget this now because it was a Friday evening. Yeah, I had the kids home. My wife was home. We went out to dinner after I got done with, you know, recapping everything on this FW900. And um, it was all tested and put up. And I was like, I'm going to go worry about adjustments later. Well, we went out to dinner. We came home. And when we got home that evening, there was a giant like flash thunder uh, a thunderstorm slash uh you know just rain downpour really a lot of rain at one time and uh, when it rained i was in the basement after going out to dinner not gonna lie i had probably a whiskey drink and i was watching i was watching sean connery james bond movies on laser discs no joke after hanging out i was relaxing doing that <laughs> and when I was doing that, I, uh, I, I started to fall asleep, but I started to hear the rain in, in my dreams, I remember. And all of a sudden, I remember waking up, and I could just hear water like it was coming in the house. And unfortunately, once a year, that happens in the basement here. And it's generally not a huge amount of water, and I'm really prepared for it. But whenever it happens, it always makes a big cleanup mess. So... I woke up and I noticed, yeah, water started to come in and I look up at one of my windows and I have these windows in the basements here and they're little windows. They're half the size vertically as they are uh, as a standard window. And then they're the same width. And what had happened is I look over and one of those is, is a couple of those are under recessed into the ground. And I look over and there's a whole, it looks like an aquarium. There was about... 70 80 percent of the way up of this glass pane there was a water line and this had just filled this entire uh drainage hole with water uh, where the window is and i was just like oh my goodness you know thankfully i'd gone through and sealed that a year ago but it had uh it, it started to come through the wall down through the basement wall into the flooring and i had to run outside and ultimately what had happened is a gutter got clogged i unclogged the gutter water stopped flowing into the hole where the window was i had to bail out all the water from the window hole to get it back down to ground level and then i was spending all weekend uh that whole night really cleaning up the water and uh, I know it sounds crazy because I've got, you know, a lot of electronics you can see around here, but I'm so prepared for this. And uh, the reason this kind of went fine was the fact that everything in my shop that's of any importance is suspended when I'm not working on it. So there's no real risk unless there was like five, uh, two or three feet of water in here that anything would get hit with water. And that never happens. We're talking, you know, a little bit like... Worst case scenario, some places would get hit with a quarter, half an inch, but it was enough all over the place to soak up into rugs. And um, I had to basically move everything out, clean the floors and get rid of those rugs. And that just, you know, caused such a such a time waster thing. I wish that I got some footage of the uh, the drain or the, the thing that looked like a fish tank and so that's that was the flood thing that had happened in the meantime i did pick up all the pcs and take them out even though they're suspended just to be safe um, all my power is suspended hanging from wall uh, studs so there's nothing on the ground that was water uh that was in the water of any significance besides rugs like i said and 
So all that had happened. I got all that cleaned up and uh, I started to put things back together. And in that process, of course, I wasn't able to do any streaming, uh, but I did put the streaming setup that I used to have here. I put it back together and it worked great for like a day. And so I opened it back up, which was probably dumb. I tried to do something inside of it. And uh, hey, thanks for the super chat, Tor Christian Mo. Thank you very much. It says thank you. Um, so I took, I, I don't know, if you have a question, make sure you tag me if there's a question that you had to go with that. I'm sorry, I've been kind of rambling here. I don't see one. But if you do have one, please let me know. So I... I went and um, started, you know, or I, I had reassembled the PC for this streaming setup. I had tested it, and then I, I, you know, what I was doing? I was trying to add some different hardware to it, and in the process, it just it's it killed the PC or it updated or something, and the PC would not boot at all. Uh, I did get a little bit of power, but no real boot response from it. So. Um, it was a really cheap setup anyway. It was it didn't even have a GPU in it. It was using a uh, really basic hardware and a basic motherboard. So I had to get a whole different setup. So that's what I'm using now. And I had to get basically everything in this is new outside of the hard drive and the RAM. Uh, I'd had to go with a new tower, motherboard, uh, new trip, new cooler new graphics card now a lot of this stuff was used uh, but it's a lot more powerful so i'm testing it today uh, that's that's basically what i've done i had to go through all morning um, and this is the other crazy thing about this new streaming pc i got it all set up uh this very this or yesterday i finished building it yesterday and i put it together i got it booted up it was working great and then i got a windows 11 update requirement or request I did it and then it wouldn't reboot. It was the craziest thing. It was a Windows reboot or it wouldn't get into Windows. I had to actually go in and reinstall Windows and I didn't lose any personal files like videos or pictures. And what I did lose though was every app that I had on the PC that I use like OBS, Steam Deck, uh, all the audio software, all my drivers for everything. Whole slate was wiped completely clean all the way down to basic windows plus my personal files. So that was just crazy how um, that went down. And I had to go through reinstall everything. I've been going through now resetting up OBS. So hopefully everything sounds good, looks pretty decent. Uh, things be seem to be going okay right now on the stream. So um, I just wanted to give you that update. Uh, as far as any of the hardware in here, you know, it's all kind of a couple generations old, but still very usable. Not like super old, definitely more powerful than the last PC. So hopefully in the long run, all this will be better. And also after the flood, I finally took out my own storage unit. Uh, I finally got a storage unit. I posted a couple pictures about that on Twitter. So if you want to see those, you can check that out. I know, person who celery said i should have gone with windows 10 i wish i could have i don't know what happened um this one was one that just gosh it, it automatically updated one day i didn't even want it to hey jake good to see you jake good to see you race Aroni. and uh so yeah i i did that i got a storage unit in town here it's not a very big one but it's enough to fill up i've already gotten um oh goodness i think like almost 15 crts in it so that's cool. It gives me some space and I will have more space upstairs to work and get in bigger CRTs, which I do have some. I mean, I've got some amazing stuff coming, you guys, this summer. You're not going to believe it. Uh, finally, things. I don't really want to spoil a lot. And uh, so that's it. Storage unit. I will make a cool episode where I go check out that storage unit. I'll show you what's in there sometime. I promise. <laughs> and a uh, couple more announcements. First off, I did also tweet out and put a notice other social media places that I will be at Retro World Expo this year. So, yes, thank you to everybody who's been asking me and bugging me and kind of making me really want to go again this year. 
Um, I will be there. I will be driving up Friday and then being there Saturday, Sunday. I will be at the show a little bit and I'll take off and drive back to Virginia. So I will see anybody who is going to the Retro World Expo. I'll see you there in Connecticut. And it's the last weekend in August. So that's about uh six seven eight weeks from now um yes raceroni it is very it's a very nice it's actually a brand new storage units it was a brand new building it's from u-haul it's got state-of-the-art security i was actually really surprised state-of-the-art security it's uh climate controlled it's got alarms built into it like for my unit not just the whole building, but actually for the individual unit. And like I said, it was brand new. And, and it's not that expensive. It's like $80 at the end of the day, a month. $80 per month, US. Hey, my retro fix. Thanks for coming in. Koala Koa. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you here. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'll show it to you. It's cool. See, I got, I got lucky there because they just came available. So um, it's super awesome. It's got a drive-in garage with automatic doors. So I pull up, I press a button, the garage door comes up, I go inside the building, and then I open up my vehicle inside the climate-controlled building. I go get a, a cart, which is right beside that, fill the cart with CRTs, go down the hallway, and you literally go down the hallway and take the first left and my uh, unit is the very first unit there. That's why I really wanted to get it now when they were running promotional, you, you know, for setting up the new stuff. When they were running the promos, I wanted to get it um, then. And I also got great, like I said, a unit right at the big front, uh, which is great because then I can move stuff in and out of there really easy without having to go all the way back through a maze of the building or having to go up. And it's like seven stories this building is. And I only, uh, I, I got the base floor. So it's like right next to this drive-in thing. It's perfect. Uh, so that's exciting to me. Um, and again, like I said, Retro World Expo, I will be there. If anybody can make it there and wants to say, hey, I'll be glad to talk to you. I'll be following around Bob most of the time. I'll be hanging out in the lobby of the Marriott when I'm not in the expo hall or eating somewhere. So I'm not... Uh, if you want to go see what happened last year, you can check out a video I made on the channel not too long ago about what it was like to be there. And the last thing I'll mention before we get into this is a stream. I'm going to be setting up to do a stream with uh, our good buddy, the 8-Bit Esquire. And we're going to try to do that this weekend. I will also try to get Lewis to record an episode of the Cathode Ray podcast uh, this weekend. But there's been so much stuff going on between the two of us. He's been starting a new business career with a new company. So it's all, um, it's all, you know, been just a, a, a crazy summer, honestly. And, uh, oh, Guillerme, Guillerme Solda, thank you for the $5 super chat. Storage was more expensive or harder to find. So the funny thing was, is the pricing was pretty much same price, no matter where. I looked at um, it was all within five dollars for the same size unit and this is the smallest unit temperature controlled I believe they call it five by five by like 12 feet tall is as tall as you could store inside this thing and so it's not a huge space it's five by five by 12 uh, but they were all like that every one of them and every one of them was between 80 to 85 dollars per month on the expenses so then you have to start looking at the anemones and this new place was brand new the unit was right next to the door and um the unit was right next to the door like i said all the good stuff about it that made that one easier to pick plus it's it was all funny enough they were all scattered around and they were the same distance from me every single one of them the only thing i would have done better on is if i had get a bigger storage unit uh, the prices were a little bit more varying on that. They would go from one like ten, one hundred and fifteen dollar range all the way up to like a hundred and forty dollar range. So, um, good question. 
J Russell Retro Gaming. Hey, how you doing? Uh, Bob, yes, RGB, Retro RGB Bob. That's who we'll be hanging out with. That's who I usually go hang out with down there. And let's, hey, let's get started, okay? Let's, um, enough talking about everything going on. Uh, thank you for being patient. We've gone 20 minutes into this stream. Let's get switched over here. And we're going to talk about today's goodies. And if you have any questions, I'll try to, you know, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat closely. And if anything stops, or like if there's any technical difficulties, let me know. Uh, and I'll be paying attention to the chat as we get into this. That way we can have a good experience. But I've got a couple things to show you here. First off, I have a complete drive file of this S Sony FW900. Um, and what it is, is it's just an entire photo gallery of all the work I did to this uh, CRT. So I'm going to go through all these photographs with you. We'll go through. You'll be able to see part numbers. You'll be able to see all kinds of things on these boards. I'm going to go through how I made the cap kits here. I actually have um the documents i use to make these cap kits they look a little crazy so uh <laughs> i'm going to explain my process here and we're going to have some fun while we do it we'll look at all these great pictures this is going to be stuff where you'll get to see everything that happened to this crt i took i, mean, I think there's a couple hundred photographs here so uh, this is all what was sent to the client. I actually don't own this CRT. You saw Don Honk. I mentioned him earlier in the chat. This was his CRT. That's the one you see pictured on the thumbnail today. And that's the ones we're going to be looking at. Uh, we're going to go ahead. I'm just going to start in here with our first photograph. We make sure that we've got our everything lined up over there and things are looking good. Okay, we're ready to roll. All right, so as I said, this is the back of the Sony FW900. And what, what an amazing piece of machinery. Now, you've already, you're have you seeing it already blown open, and a lot of the shielding is removed. Uh, we're specifically starting in here at the deflection board, which... If you're looking at the back of the CRT like we are, that is to your right-hand side. And that's what's missing in this picture is the deflection board has been removed. And if you look down here, you can see how this is connected. You'll see some closer pictures of this. But it has ribbon cables. It has connection cables. It has screws. It has shielding mounts and all kinds of good goodies here. So um, here's just a look at this tube. If you ever have a question about the tube model number, this is your model number, right? Okay, that's it. M57LRX15X. And this is a tube that will match or go into a A-series 24-inch BVM or a D-series 24-inch BVM. So if you have a good tube from any of those three monitors, it's interchangeable. Here is the deflection card. Now, I'm going to get this question. I have a full episode with video of me actually working on this. That is in the works. It's not completed because I still have to adjust the set and things and use the Windows and film some more. So that process is still ongoing today. But... This kind of photo gallery thing will not be done in that video, okay? This is different. So you're not going to be, we're not going to be redundant, but we're going to go through some of these things. But as you notice, this has our anode cap right here, which you do have to disconnect the anode cap. And this portion right here, this actually connects into your neck board. So you have to carefully, it's part of the CRT neck socket. You have to carefully release that from the neck board and get it out also to get out the um, the board itself. And that, this is the restoration project on just the deflection card to start here, okay? So this is, I've, I've pulled it here. I've recorded the capacitors for uh, what's on this 
board and that's what you see under it right there let me show you here if i go over here to the desktop camera now look i know i spilt uh i spilt rubbing alcohol when i was cleaning the boards on on this paper so it looks like some kind of cheesy art that i made but what i've done here is i've gone and i found the service manual for the Sony FW900, which is readily available online. And then I've gone to the very back where it has the parts list, okay? And this is, it, it, I've gone to the section for the D board. And if you look over here, this is the capacitor section. Now, this is a blurry mess, but the ones that I marked off originally that you could see clearly back here on the picture, uh, the ones that I've left blank are the listed electrolytic capacitors that are on the board and uh so i've referred that to this list you know i referred that list i printed it out i got just the capacitors i need to change on there and then i went and i removed every capacitor on this board and as i removed each one i confirmed that it was what it was marked on in the service manual Okay, so here's some more photographs of these old capacitors. More old capacitors. There was quite a few on some of these boards. Some didn't have as many. The deflection card, of course, has a lot. You'll also notice large heat sinks on this board. Here's another look at that neck connector. Just some more documentation of the board. Now, this is what it looks like with the uh, capacitors removed and cleaned and what I will note to you is on this board you'll notice these large areas on the printed circuit board that are copper plates and it's a ground plate so sometimes it takes a lot of heat to get that solder mo uh, molten sorry solder molten and suck it out of those holes with the FR 300 or 301 from Hacko. So that's just one warning. You have to be very careful. It takes a lot of uh, precision in here. So that's just a section. That's a section that you saw capacitors in earlier. Now they've been removed. Again, the other section there. And um, this is what the bottom of the board looks like after removing all those capacitors. Mm. here is a good photograph of all the old capacitors um, these were all removed and the one thing I will note is there's a big mix of brands in here everything from Jamicon to Nishicon, Rubicon, Panasonic, Elna all of them in here um, there also was a difference in quality some of them were 85 degree I always try to go 105 degree on replacements, but you sometimes have to mix brands. That's fine. I use high quality uh, worth capacitors here and some Rubicons and Nishicons in there. And all these met or exceeded the quality standards. But that's what it looks like. I just installed all those capacitors after removing all them. Here's just some photographs of the after job, and it just looks really nice, you know, cleaned up. I've had the um, interesting question, you know, because I figured eventually this would come up, because people are like, why do you use Worth Electronics and Rub Rubicon? Why don't you just stick to Nishikon? Really, a lot of this has to do with parts shortages when it was difficult to find parts, but worth uh seems to have very good stock in the united states also i researched worth and they had quality standards that seemed to be uh really good as far as anything else now they're just different it's like different names right as long as it's not a real crap quality fake capacitor um you know made in china that's a like counterfeit everything's okay as long as it's one of the high qualities from a good vendor you could go read like the data sheets on how these test out and uh, ripple currents and get really into it if you want to. But you'll notice, see, even right here, I've got Worth and Rubicon. And it really just depends on uh, the application. 
So there's not, uh, but even still, if I replace a 25 year old lower uh, 85 degree Nishikon with a higher end premium worth electronic, uh, worth electric, you know, you, you're still getting a better. Um, yeah. It, it, sometimes on some of these parts you got to take what you can get and then when you have them here in the shop you're going to use them so that's kind of the scenario here uh, all right just some more pictures of the uh, but I, I believe in all the good brands that's what i'm saying i had to get away from just the part shortage made me get away from just be focused at, just to be focused on nishikon and rubicon only so um that's really the truth more pictures of the finished product really had to go in there and just clean up i also like to go through and make sure especially on a, a monitor of this uh, magnitude and board of this quality just check the other components as you're working in here make sure everything's got some nice room some of these resistors and and things can bend over and a lot of times they're probably safe but if something bends over like down here and grounds out well, that could cause issues so you want to be careful make sure before you reconnect to the board, that you've done all that. Here's just a look at the bottom side of the board and uh, proof that I use a grounding strap that's flipped over at that point, so that's not good, but <laughs> it's there. Um, I also go through and I reflow solder on lots of parts under here just to make sure that there's no issues in the future. And I'm mostly talking about like these points right here where you have ICs and things like that. and um, so that's that's something that you might need to do on your boards. It's just a closer look at the capacitor and how the board looks after I do it. I like to clean it up, um, you know, right after that, after getting everything done. More pictures of just the capacitor replacements afterwards. And a look at a lot of the places. Like the thing about... Uh, this monitor I wanted to show specifically is you have oh you have you have capacitors that end up you know having small surface mount components either in between them like up here right see this and next to that is another one right there so you have to be very careful because you could easily heat this up too much and disturb this capacitor over here. So that's why, uh, you know, these have to be, these have to be carefully done and, and you have to take your time if you're actually going to work on these boards. All right, there it is reseated in the shielding. We're about to be done with the deflection card here. And there we have a test shot of it afterwards. I always recommend when working on extremely large CRTs like this with a lot of boards in them that you test your boards every time you can individually after you work on each one because what can happen is you could damage something and then you wouldn't know which board you had actually caused the issue from here's just a picture of that board reinstalled there and the board reinstalled here afterwards and you can tell the heat sinks on here, they, they go through the whole board. So those heat sinks actually tie into the shielding. And then that comes over here into this shielding, which ultimately taps into the shielding here to try to make this a giant heat, heat disbursement uh, because there's no active cooling going on in here as far as fans or anything. It's all gonna be passively done through heat sinks and then wind or air going through the vent holes on the sides of the CRT. And that's actually the last photo uh, on that particular board. But do not fear because we have more boards to look at. Let's go here to the neck board. So this is another board I would consider one of the vital boards. And, you know, when you're working on these things... You can start with certain boards to work on because they're the outer boards. Um, you will have to move 
and re remove this board, this neck board, to actually get to the D board. So if if I were recommending anything, I would recommend that you work your way almost backwards from what we're doing here. Um, I, I started with the power supply, and then I went to this neck board, and then there's a couple neck boards behind this board, and then I actually finished with the deflection card. So we're going from my last to my first almost here, so... This is our neck board, and it's actually broken off, and you have a secondary board where the uh, neck socket is right there. The CRT socket goes into there. It's got some breakout cables over here that go to this other board, and then this other board is the A board, and that's the board with the capacitors in it that you need to change. And you notice you need to disconnect this main screw right here to get this board off. You'll have to take some of the shielding with it. So there's another, there's a heat sink over here that has a screw hiding in there. You need to get that out. And then um, you probably will have to, no, you don't have to get this bottom one out here yet. But you can. Uh, and then you need to get, make sure all the screws underneath this input tray are disconnected. So it's it's got a lot of uh, process you can look at. There's a closer look at this first ribbon cable. So you want to check that, make sure that's all good. Um, there's another connection point here. And see, that's how you remove that screw. See how that heat sink has thermal paste right up next to the main board. Now you'll, you'll also notice a nasty buildup on the inside of the CRT. And this one was actually owned by a smoker, unfortunately, one day or at some point, and there's a lot of this built-up soot inside of here, so there was extra cleaning I had to do also on this set. But that's, see, that's a look at that neck socket right there. See, you have, so what you have to do is you release this input board, and then, or I'm sorry, it's got the inputs on the bottom also, but input slash neck board, you remove this, and then you can disconnect that center portion from the neck socket right there by releasing these two tabs right here. And you get that pulled free like that. And uh, really, you have to remove the shielding so you can slip that thing in that hole right there so you can get it out and get your deflection board out. <laughs> So it's not, it's not, again, you've got to go through certain processes. You have to be really patient working on this. So there's the board removed and that's pre-servicing. Uh, there's another one of me taking and making all the capacitor, the capacitor kit right there for the, um, let's see, it's the A board on this one. And so I did the same thing where I went through, and I'm going to mention this one time uh, when it comes up, it's going to be important. But we're going, um, sorry, I was checking out something here, making sure everything was good. Okay. So I've gone through here and again made this. Uh, cap kit for this board. You'll notice that there's the, something to zoom in here that I couldn't show you a good picture of. There's this connection point right here, which you have to disconnect this connection point and of course this one opposite side of it. But this connection point right here goes to the B and C connectors on the bottom plate of the input board. And this is your VGA connector right here. And there's mounting screws that you need to remove here to remove it from the back plate. Uh, so that's just some notes on the neck board here. Closer look at the neck board. This is after removing the capacitors. You can tell the capacitors are gone. And more capacitors are gone. This is a, a chunk of the area where we remove the capacitors. Cleaned up. Again, more capacitors being removed. And we make sure that there's... Plenty of thermal paste on there that needs to be. You don't have to add excessive ones if it's if you've got it off there and there's still some on there, you're fine. Uh, but here's just the bottom side. And this is what, again, what I was talking about. This is a great example of 
you really have to be highly you know skilled at solder soldering welding with these soldering irons to be able to pull these capacitors and not not cause any trouble for yourself like look at we've got a surface mount in between every one of these capacitors over here and a resistor attached to every single line there and it doesn't take a lot to knock that off or put too much heat on there so it's, it's, it's a tricky board hey samuel g good to see you today and bill d thanks for coming in very stressful but that's how you do it get every cap out of there there's the new capacitors and i'm just looking over i'm going to review some of these sheets as we go through them and as i said this is the a board because what you'll notice is occasionally let's look over here at our desktop real quickly so i've got a printout here again of the a board if you look down here at the capacitor section there's only two capacitors down here that are electrolytic 25 volt 47 uf electrolytic and that's the only standard you get but so i said i went through the list here marked off if it's got a squiggly line through it or a squiggly line like that that means it's like ceramic mylar um, other types non-electrolytic capacitors so they're not being changed uh, the reason I'm showing you this is because sometimes the values will actually differ. And not on the A board, though. That actually matched matched that manual in the back, just like the D board. So those two boards have not, not had any difference between them and uh, the board. So there again, a mix of capacitor brands. All installed, cleaned up, and again, just a closer look at a lot of these capacitors. This is another board you want to reflow solder on, especially up here on your neck board and your connection points uh, and resistors that are that are in main lines. You might even have transistors that you really. If it depends on the condition of the solder on the board, but that's something to be aware of um, but this is our final picture from this board and that's that same section i showed you before where we had all those capacitors removed uh where i had told you it was stressful you still have then you have to go back in reflow and install the new capacitors and come in here and clean all your uh solder you have core flux that comes out from the actual rosin core solder that you use, which I use, leaded solder. It's best stuff, a little bit of lead in it. Rosin core. And then you can get welds like this. So that's how you get, that's how you achieve that is through practice and um, patience, learning your tools. And that's kind of like, you know, master high level crap you're going to run into in a CRT like this. Other CRTs, you will, older CRTs, you won't see stuff like this. You'll be lucky if you have a board that has just components on one side only. All right. That's really it for the neck board. Not much to that one compared to the other board. Let's go to the power supply. This is a fun one. Look at this. This is a good picture that shows you some more of that dust buildup I was talking about. Right? See that? That's a mix of dust and cigarette exhale smoke, secondhand smoke. So that's, yuck, that's real disgusting. It stunk too. You can see it's, it's hazy over here on the back of this tube also. There was more of that. That was all over the boards. That, this is the power supply. This is where I recommend you start because it's easiest to pull out on its own. You don't have to remove any of the other boards to get it out. So you can do it first and uh, fix it first. So you pull that one. It's just got a couple connection points in here, about three or four. Unscrew it and remove the board. That's the other side of the tube. You can see again, like all this nasty haze of cigarette smoke just 
inside the CRT. Another look at the side there. And there's the board pulled with some lovely CRTs behind it. I think I had picked this picture to try to make a live stream a thumbnail when I was going to try to live stream me actually recapping the boards. But that all happened while the flood happened. So that was not anything of use. So on this board, we have bigger capacitors, some really odd capacitors. Uh, so you have to be mindful of that. Here's just a look at the power board. You have these really high filter, high size, high specific. We're going to take a closer look at that cap when I remove it because it was kind of a tricky one. But here's a picture of all the other smaller caps removed. Uh, the G board is what we're looking at here. And I'm going to actually get the documents. Yes, G board is next. So that's good on our list. Because there's some things that have to be different on this. I know it. Um, just, yeah, here's the board. It's gotten the capacitors removed right there. You can see some photographs of that. And fully recapped the other sections of the board with all the capacitors removed. And you will find occasionally... Like this was uh, work that was done here, probably in the factory after assembly or post assembly. But you'll often find just one or two spots on some boards where it looks really nasty, a lot of flux left over, and generally three, three to four times as much solder as you would normally need. So when I see this, I generally remove that old solder and clean that up, and try to clean up those welds as well as clean up the board from that residue. Excuse me. There's just another picture of all those points. Uh, in one photograph, you can see all the different points of solder removed. And the capacitors are all gone. Save our big one. That's the one that is still on the board at this moment. But uh, there, all are, there are all the rest of the capacitors removed. And there's the big one removed. And I wanted to show this one on its own because you can tell it's not a straight line so you do have to get a specific style of capacitor where you have a right degree turn for your leg right there so it's pretty pretty important if you're going to replace that capacitor now a lot of times you don't have to replace this specific one but anyway we were removing them all there you go and there you go new capacitors in new capacitors in 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 mix of brands now this one's another one i would go around and recommend reflowing solder especially on these points like this these cues these transistors also good idea to do it on the transformers Right there okay there's a couple of those see that there and then i like to do the connection points also and that's really how you get that done and you gotta clean it afterwards there's the g board now let's before we go put that in i did want to mention some fun, interesting things on the g board cap list so again, I will be making a cap kit that I'll be publishing with the video for this for Patreon members. They can look at that and do whatever they want to with it uh, as far as making their own cap kit for it and using it in their own CRTs. Uh, but if you look here, same style sheet I've gone and done 25 electrolytic capacitors. There was, for some reason, C680. It's listed as 0.08. 068 farads 10 volts well that's just 6800 microfarads so uh, i just wanted you to know that's what's actually on the board and this one so here's something interesting look at this if you do run it you you need this is why you always have to refer this board or your board to these lists uh, because sometimes there's revisions to your board parts are different Specifically, when I got onto the G board over here to C685, in the manual it lists as at a 10 volt 100. Which you can see I've marked out there a 10 volt 100 microfarad capacitor. 
But in actuality, on the board, there was a 10 volt to 20 microfarad capacitors. And that's what I changed it to. Whatever was on the board, not what was on the manual. Because again, this is a, apparently a revision that's not on the main manual. And it wasn't as if someone had gone in and replaced this specific capacitor to this value. This was done in the factory. It was the same factory capacitor. It was just different from the manual listing. Oh, hey, Don. Welcome back. Yeah, hey, James. Hey, James Boone. Welcome in. Andres. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. Anders. Gunner, son. Oh, uh, yeah. There were a bunch of capacitors that were actually out of spec. Uh, that doesn't... That didn't really translate to much as far as knowing the difference. This was a specifically preventive maintenance job. But that was something I noted on the on the manual, and it made me scratch my head because I checked it like 25 times as I was doing it just to make sure everything was good. So that's uh, the but that's the the listing for the G board, and that's how I've got to the point with that capacitor. Hey, overclock wise, welcome in and. So here's the board reinstalled. And again, this was the first one I did. That's why the rest of these still look dirty. So we're going backwards as I'm in my pictures here. And this one's super clean, this board. That's for a test. And I love testing the Sega Dreamcast with this set and really any of these VGA sets, especially now since you have a, we have a copy of the 240p test suite available for it. You know, it is a pretty intimidating... Of course it's intimidating because you're always nervous even when you know you've done the work right that what if something happens when you plug it back in? So I can't say that any time that a monitor really is worth more than um, any time you get over a 20, it's almost just PVM anymore, especially something that's hard to replace. It's really, really... Sh yeah, it's intimidating and it's it's just part of the job. But it definitely can be. All right, so that's our look into the neck board. Let's look at a couple of smaller boards now. All right, so this one's the end board. I think we should go to the S board first. If we go back here, remember when I told you that, you know, those are the three primary boards, right? That we've looked at so far. That being power supply, deflection card, main neck board input board there on the back but if you remove the shielding some more you'll find out that there are secret boards underneath underneath and buried within this so you have to get this back played out carefully carefully again you have some uh, a array of cables there uh, there's a look at the crt socket on the tube really nice and clean but if we look down here, we'll notice there's a connection cable right here we need to disconnect. Um, we have a... Yep, I took a picture of it. You have another cable here to disconnect. See that? A lovely ribbon cable. And once you get all those ribbon cables disconnected, um, I was documenting where some other cables went. This cable goes into that end board that's hidden under there so those two boards they definitely need to be uh serviced they're important boards this s board and that end board so this is the s board large heat sink here a lot of lower end capacitors on this board a lot of 85 degree capacitors um this is a big logic board with that big chip in the middle there's all the capacitors that were removed and it looks like, again, we have a... Look at this. It's there. You see, I started it. Let me check my notes, but... We'll, we'll double check it. We're looking at the... List. For the S board. Yep. Right here. Mm -mm -mm. And this... My friends, is why you have to take the extra time to look at this and not just order the caps off this list, remove the caps on your board, and then go back and just fill whatever's on this list in without double-checking everything. 
always double check everything because when we get down here to C3046 it was actually a 50 volt 22 microfarad and originally it was a 10 microfarad capacitor you see that right there 50 volt 10 as opposed to what it was on the main board was actually 5022 5022 so yeah that's like that's why you got to be careful let's see if we can find C3046 uh, it's not going to be able to see that on that board, but there's a look at all the capacitors removed. There's some inside this heat sink tunnel. I call it the heat sink tunnel. And I gave you a shot there. There were actually capacitors in there. I think I show a good picture of this um, once they're added. Again, this board has small parts. Oop. That's it. Stop it. There we go. There's all our replacements, all higher quality. There you go. Installed. And there you can see it. See how there's all those capacitors inside that tunnel? Lots of them in there. And again, this is a general maintenance job. Or not general, you know, big time maintenance job. This is like once every 20 year maintenance job. 10 years. I mean, it shouldn't, you shouldn't have to do this again for a long time. Unless you're running it non-stop. This should last a few thousand hours easily. Um, that's it for our board right here. This is, this, is the, this is the most stressful part. Because you really have to do all three of these boards. The end board, the S board, and then that neck board. You have to do all those kind of at the same time. And then when you do them... Of course, it's nerve-wracking because uh, you, you don't get to test them. It's hard to put it back together, so you have to wait to put it back together when you finish those three boards and test it kind of at once. Good questions. Thank you, everybody, for coming in today. We're having fun. I hope you guys are enjoying this. I know it's a little bit different, but we're taking a special look at this since I wasn't able to bring you the live stream of repairing uh, and doing these capacitor replacements on these boards. So uh, I just realized I left like the background audio rolling the whole time. I know it's just jazz, but I think I'm going to cut it off for the rest of the show and uh, stop all that because I don't know how that sounds and I hope it didn't. Some people don't like the background music as much. All right. So this is what we're looking at now. We've removed both the neck board and that board we just looked at, which was our S board. And they're out of the way. And we, deal, deal, ugh, we need to deal with this last board here. Down in the bottom. Underneath everything with all these ribbon cables. All the ribbon cables. Like, um, the reason, another reason I go in and take these kind of photographs is so if I have to know how this was originally put together, I want to know what it looked like. I want to know the way all these cables were bent. I wish <laughs> copyright free out of the tiger. I paid for a copyright license for all the cheesy background music you hear to Epidemic Sound, $15 a month. Good money spent. So yeah, you can see in there again, this is where I've got all that film that I'm putting my finger in, all down there, smoke build up, blah, 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 yummy. And again, lots of ribbon cables. This goes into the deflection card over here, two of them, over into this board. This board is like the heart. This is like the central nervous system of this FW900, this board down here. Everything goes to it, everything. And then it all breaks out from there. So that's where everything's being, all the information, uh, super highways going through this board right here. And it has the most capacitors. And while they are Rubicon, Nishikon, there's some Jamicons in there. There's some Elons, Emons, uh, Delons. I don't know. <laughs> there's all kinds of different ones in this board. But the 90% on this board are 85. You can see it right there. Uh, it's blurry. It's a blurry. But it says 85 degrees on it. So we could go in here and replace it with wonderful 
better capacitors. But again, lots of photos so I can see how all these cables go in properly. And I don't want to mess anything up. I don't want to bend a ribbon cable. There's even one in the front. Stuff to the power supply. See, there's the front one. Look at that. Definitely one of the more strenuous boards to pull and service. And there we go. All the caps removed. Lots of caps on this board. Lots of them. I mean, this had the most, I think it almost had 40 caps. And if we look at the list, everyone, again, look at this difference here for C, C, C062. A 100 microfarad, 25 volt capacitor is what's listed here. What was actually on the board? A 10 volt, 10 volt, 470 microfarad. That's ridiculous. So much different in that capacitor. So that's one of the reasons I really felt compelled to just come in here in the stream and share this information. I haven't hidden anything. I've shown you every single cap list here that, you know, is different from what it says on the monitor. So I just want you to know that, okay? But here's this lovely board. You got these, uh, I don't even know, I think this is like a weird, it looks like an inductor that Sony's built, like a custom inductor on this, on an IC platform. And then you got um, this proprietary chip, lots of... Uh, Lots of capacitors. Just look at them. Numbers of them. Almost all capacitors. This board. And logic chips. A couple resistors. And uh, that's pretty much it. You know, crystals. Oh man, my retrofix, that sounds awful. That sounds terrible. Yeah, you know, um one I'm I'm the we're getting to this point now where if there is a fault in these original capacitors, you'll see it. And like um we're getting to the age now and NECs are notorious for this. They have these surface mount capacitors, those are gonna start to fail on us. And that's that's going to become more and more important is to get rid of those surface mount capacitors. Um, yes. Yes, Master Safer P11110. Yes, this is very similar to that. I think that's like the uh, Dell you know, 4 by 3 version of kind of this, ver this CRT. Here's another look at the um, capacitors removed on that board. Close look at that chip. You've also got this interesting chip here that was flashed, I think, you know, and... So if, the problem is, is if you ever have a trouble with any of these chips, good luck finding anything. You may be able to get lucky and call Sony and they'll have one somewhere in a basement. But most likely it's all gone. Again, we're running into a common theme on these boards. Lots of parts on both sides. So you have to be very careful. All that. I mean, just like... You can't put heat on these pads too long. You'll burn the burn them up too. So it's it takes a close touch. There's all the old capacitors. Old capacitors right there. We'll look at some of them. Maybe I'll get a picture where we can see that. Yep, see? 85 degrees right there. Uh, Rubicon, Rubicon. Most of those are Rubicon right there. Except these blue ones are a different one. It's like Lelon or something. And these silvers, those are actually in the back. Those are Nishikon. And I can't remember. It's like International Chemical Company or something. And there we go. Replacement. Everything back in. Some parts. There we go. Back on the back of the board. Yes, that's the Gamers Nexus mat. That's what I use here. If you look over, uh, just a quick look over at the desktop cam. I have this mod mat. And uh, they actually have a new soldering mat that I actually want to get. But it's kind of plain. Maybe it'll look better on the streams. I also have the huge PC builder mat on another table that I work on sometimes. Because it's just such a great, great mat. 
All right, this is going to be kind of getting close to the end of these slides, but we're, you know, I'm just showing you kind of what this stuff looks like afterwards. I like to clean it all up. I like to fix welds that were left nasty, and I like to remove all the unnecessary flux residue. And I want to make sure that, like, if somebody has to come back here and do that again, if somebody wants to come back here and do this again in a couple of years, decades their ability to do so is still preserved that's another thing to think about some of this hardware you get in and you realize you can only recap it like once because it'll fall apart but if it's something like this oh mind void i was asking the question about low tvs and storage is that bad for caps only if it's high heat extreme cold if it's pretty well temperature maintained, you should be fine for storage. Oh, somebody was asking about reset and service menus. Gosh, I really don't recommend doing that. You could end up with more trouble sometimes. Your best bet would be to try to find the monitor or the CRT manual specifically for that and see what the factory settings are um, in on the set because sometimes you can change it and the factory might put it in a different region a literally different region like i've seen somebody set have it in one language and then you do a factory reset and it changes everything to a different language and causes other issues where it's actually changing the hardware to sometimes go to a different video signal so you have no way to correct it so um, I would highly recommend before trying to completely reset it that you go in, you Google and search for that specific model you're looking for. And even if you have to pay three or four dollars for a manual, that's the don't get the don't get the. Uh, what am I trying to say here? Don't get the user manual, get the service manual. That will have the better information in it. All right, there's the finished board again, everybody. And that's the last of the pictures for that board. And that, my friends, may be... Whoops. That looks like that was the end of our... Uh, let me make sure that is it. And we'll just go down here and pull back up the file. And... Deflection, neck board, power supply, other boards. Yep, that's everything. We went through it all. Okay. So, what I can do now is I uh, might uh, just hang out here for another minute. I've, again, got some other things planned for the week. Um, as far as streams, I hope to do a couple streams this weekend. I'll also say that this has been one of the coolest fun toys I've gotten recently. <laughs> From friend Don Honk, who is the owner again of this monitor. The longest screwdriver I have. And uh, it's a lot of fun to use. You need it on a CRT like this where you have to go a long way. But it's almost like you play almost pool with this thing. Harry Potter wand. But it's just an ESD safe. Oops. ESD safe screwdriver that is literally um a 12 inch it's got a 12 inch extension on it one foot so lots of fun very helpful if i find one i'll put an amazon link to it somewhere talk about it sometime but really have been enjoying this on other crts also uh thank you james if anybody has any questions about what i've gone over i don't mind going back over something if you want to look at something again uh -oh. Just note that, again, I, I want to reiterate that the big announcements are we'll have a new video. It's already set to come out tomorrow, so if you're hanging out here and you want to help out, again, hit a like on this video. Then when we're done here, just click a, a like on the premiere uh, for the other video for me, and I will, so I will definitely be in the chat for that video tomorrow. And it's about a 20 two minute video so it's not short 
Hey, thank you for the five dollar super chat, Demon tw Twenty Child. So I have a twenty. I have a. Oh, excuse me. I have the Sony KV thirteen FS one hundred on the left side of the screen. It's stretched. There's not a setting in the service menu. Where do I look for to adjust it? So if it's just, it depends how much out. Um, because it could be a couple things. Depends how much out on the side it is. Sometimes when you get an expanded side like that, you'll have uh, the yoke could be moved and actually aiming a little bit off on one edge and beaming the geometry out all to the side. So that can happen. Uh, I would also say if you get into the service menu and you can't get it to adjust horizontal yeah you um you should well first off if you go to the horizontal settings and change it does it actually change the setting if you change like horizontal phase or if it says h center and you move it does it actually move or does the one side just not move at all so if you don't get any movement in those it's probably a capacitor issue so you need to get the board we're looked at uh, beforehand otherwise i would think it would be that also a possibility that po 17 mentioned could be a linearity issue where the linearity capacitors are bad so you could try linearity adjustment too uh, but i'd try to see if you can move it horizontally to the center and also that horizontal size if you expand it and it's only moving on one side that would tell me that part of there's there's problems somewhere in that circuit like that horizontal circuit so I would suggest checking out that horizontal circuit. And yeah, if the yoke moves at all, it can mess up a lot of things. So if you open up the set, if it was moved, if it was shipped at all. Hey, James, thank you for the $10 super chat. Just showing support for the channel. Have a great week. Thank you, James. I appreciate it. Show favorite. He's always here. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. A lot of you guys are always here, and I really appreciate your uh, continuing support and watching of the channel and everything. Like I said, hopefully uh, once... Man, it's just so hard to continue <laughs> to guarantee I can be back on things, but I, as long as all this computers and everything plays nicely, I will be back in the studio uh, as soon as tomorrow night, because it's already Thursday, um, I, I've got I've been talking to Keith Rainey about doing some adjust, calibration stream with him again, a more depth, in depth one, um, and also like I said, Eight Bit Esquire. We're going to do a stream soon whenever he's allowed to get out of her and uh, get get free from work. We're gonna we're gonna check that out uh, with him because he's been doing a lot of content, and uh, so we'll we'll get together on that oh that's an eu model yeah see i would just read if there's is there a, look in the manual it should tell you how to do a factory reset and see usually in a manual menu when you when it says how to do it it gives you standard readings but it doesn't always you're right so Thanks. I'm glad a lot of people really enjoyed this. I know it was a little bit different, just slides and not me actually working on something. Um, I do have one of the next slide, or once I get caught up with finishing um, the two, actually I have three in here right now. They're pretty much just adjustment only. You've got the FW900. Then I'll do a stream with one of the monitors I'm unboxing of the four in tomorrow's new video. Uh, it needs a lot of work, a lot of repairs. So we'll, that's a perfect one to live stream. And I'm excited to do that one. Yeah, Brian, thank you. Yeah, it's been a while, I know, right? The show was going twice, sometimes three times a week. And then we had technical difficulties, weather difficulties. And sometimes you just get like over the holidays and it's like, well, I guess I'll just come back after the holidays. And, um, 
get back to it. So, but it'll be okay. Sometimes it's good to make sure everything's working and back to good. All right, guys, we're going just over an hour. Um, just want to say thank you again, everybody who's shown up today, participated, had a lot of great questions, a lot of great feedback, and uh, especially thank you to anybody who has super chatted in today's stream. Those donations do help out the channel a lot. And also, thank you to everybody who checks out Patreon and supports the channel that way. If you do have any other needs that are deeper than what you see here publicly, that's really the best place to get it. That's the best place to get one-on-one -on -one contact with me if you need it. We also have a large community over on Discord that is exclusive for Patreon members. And I also post there um, things that don't normally show up on YouTube or any other social media platforms. So it's all exclusive things there. Uh, also, cap kits are there. So anyway, thank you again, everybody. I will see you soon because I'm going to try to keep this. I might not even turn the streaming PC off until I'm guaranteed confident that it will, <laughs> it will work. Uh, again, if you haven't, please drop me a like on your way out. And guys, I'll see you all next time. You have a wonderful rest of the week. And uh, hopefully it'll be a lot sooner. I, I guarantee it will be. A lot sooner than it was last time. Because we at least got the release tomorrow.